Romans chapter 8, I want you to look at verse number 29. Romans 8, verse 29, the Bible reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now there's a couple phrases here that many of you probably are aware that are often uh, taken out of context. Now I, I want to I look at this phrase in the simplest form here. He says, God foreknew you are predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. You understand the Lord Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead. He has a body unlike any human body. One day we will be conformed to that image. One day we will take on this spiritual nature in eternity. And this is what this verse is talking about. But there's a stumbling block in this verse that causes a lot of misunderstandings about the Bible. When people see the word foreknow or predestinate, they're, they're all, well, what is foreknowledge? What is predestination? These are phrases that Calvinists will often attach to to create their new salvation doctrine. The title of my sermon this morning is the Calvinist Manifesto. These are verses that the Calvinists will often use and abuse and they try to prove a different salvation than what the Bible plainly teaches. And this is very important because the majority of the country is Baptist and the majority of those Baptists are Southern Baptist and Southern Baptist in doctrine have no distinction between the Presbyterians today. Listen, these are Catholic doctrines. And so today we will be debunking the doctrines of Reformed Grace. Today, the goal of this sermon is to help you to be able to defend the biblical stance of faith alone for salvation and to have an answer for the Calvinist. My goal also with this sermon is those that may be on the fence. Somebody say, well, I think I might be a two-point Calvinist. I want to help you become a zero-point Calvinist. <laughs> Listen, if somebody says, hey, I'm a five-point Calvinist, I would say they're probably not saved. Salvation is by faith alone, and that does not mean you're going to have all your doctrine in order. There are saved people that end up in Baptist churches that are teaching the sovereignty of God or Reformed theology, and they don't understand why they don't understand everything. And what it is, it's Calvinism underneath, and they don't get it. And that doesn't mean that they're unsaved because they're in the wrong church. They're hearing doctrine that's contrary to their spirit, and they don't have an answer. I want to help those people. Look, some of the five-point Calvinists, there's no help for them. There is no help. And, you know, the book of John, the book of Romans, if you just read through it plainly, you will not come up with this doctrine called Calvinism. And, you know, but they like to attach to Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 9. That is their manifesto. And I want to help plainly describe what the Bible says. I want to help you define these words so you have a better understanding. So you can give an answer to those that have an answer. Listen, I've got a disclaimer, because any Calvinist that watches, I, I've been accused falsely many times of being an Arminianist. For those of you that don't know, John Calvin was a French lawyer. He was Catholic, and he opposed the Catholic Church, and he reformed the Catholic Church. He wanted to come up with new doctrines. He protested the Catholic Church. He said, I'm the, I'm the real Catholic. Now, he called the Pope Holy Father, and he baptized babies. He did a lot of Catholic things. And I preached a whole sermon a long time ago called John Calvin, the Reprobate. And if you want to know more about his life, go watch that sermon. I'm not going to get too far off into that. He created these doctrines of grace. If you ever heard, hear the word sovereign or doctrines of grace, that's a red flag. That's a Calvinist. They're trying to inject this thought that you can't save yourself, that God picked you for your eternity. But look, we have a choice. This is very important. Now, our Jacob Arminius what, 50 years later, came out and he said, well, I don't really believe with all of Calvinism. He was a Calvinist. I think you can lose your salvation. Well, John Calvin said you could lose your salvation. I think we have free will. We have the choice. Look, Arminianism and Calvinism are both doctrines of devils. Both of these camps preach a false gospel, and both of them come out of the Roman pagan Catholic Church. We are not from Rome. We are from Christ. The doctrines that we teach and preach come out of the Word of God, and just because somebody 500 years ago came up with some brilliant idea to change the gospel, we're not going to go along with it. We will not withstand it. And look, too many, too many Baptist churches today, they have been convinced they believe what John Calvin said over what Jesus Christ said. And they try to eliminate what Jesus said. And well, you can't save yourself. Hey, 
No, no dove, right? I can't be good enough to get to heaven. I can't go die on the cross and get into heaven. Hey, I need Jesus to save me, but in no way does that mean that, there is a, that, that choice has been eliminated. And this is what Calvin is, is essentially that you don't have a choice. It's not up to you. If you end up in heaven or hell, God decided that and he calls that a gift. That's grace. Look, that's not grace. Grace means gift. The gift of God is salvation. The gift of God is not Calvinism. And there are many people that don't understand this. I mean, Revelation 22, it says, Whosoever will, let him freely take the water of life. Right? Let him take the water of life freely. That's up to you. It's your choice. Do you want to be saved? It's up to you. And Calvinists don't like that. They want to choose Calvinism over the gospel. But we are accountable. We have to make a decision. Way back in the Bible, you go back into Genesis, and there is God speaking to Cain. And he said, hey, hey, your sacrifice wasn't accepted. And he said, sin lieth at the door. Now, Cain had to choose which door he wanted to walk through. Salvation or reprobation. Do I want to become a son of God by obeying him and believing him? Or do I want to become a son of the devil? Cain chose to become a son of the devil, right? It tells us that he was of that wicked one. That's why he slew his brother. He killed his brother because he was jealous. God did not accept his sacrifice because he brought of his own works. You can't work your way to heaven. It has to be faith alone. The Calvinists would say, well, God made Cain choose to be a son of the devil. That's not true. God presented himself to Cain and said, here's your choice. What will it be? Here's your choice. What will it be? Right? He did the same thing with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is going down the road. He's blinded. There's an angel there. Why kickest thou against the pricks? God revealing himself to Paul says, hey, you're fighting against me. Do you want to still fight against me? Do you want to become a reprobate, a son of the devil like the rest of the Pharisees? Or do you want to become a child of God? Paul said, whoa, I want to be a child of God. He said, good, then go and I'll show you someone and that man will tell you words whereby you can be saved. And he believed the gospel he heard. He got saved. It was Paul's choice. The Calvinist does not believe that. They would say, well, God picked Paul to be saved, and he picked Cain for heaven, or Cain for hell. And you, you just think about that. If God were here today, and he says, well, Brother Dale, that's a nice suit. You're going to heaven. You can go to heaven today. Brother Alex, I like those sunglasses. You can go to heaven. I like that blue tie. You can go to heaven. And the rest of you go to hell. What a strange view of God. Yeah. Listen, he died for every single sin in the entire world. Salvation is a free gift. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's available to everyone. God has not excluded anybody from the gospel. Amen. You have to hear the gospel and choose to believe it to be saved. Right. And that is what Calvinism tries to eliminate. A Calvinist would tell you you're already saved without even hearing the gospel. Well, how does that work? Well, God forced this faith into your heart. And as soon as you hear it, you'll know and you'll believe. You think about how strange this is. You can't force a gift on somebody. Look, if you call me up tomorrow, hey, Brother Fannin, I just bought a brand new 80-inch TV, and I got one of those big old boxy tube TVs. I'm bringing it to your house. It's my gift to you. I'd say, uh, no, you're not. I don't want that gift. I have a choice in whether I receive a gift or not. You say, no, 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 no. On my sovereignty, I'm giving you this big old TV. I say, hey, you can go throw it in the dumpster. But don't bring it to my house. I don't want it. I'm not disposing of it. I'm not bringing it in the house. You know, I won't receive your gift. We have to choose. The Calvinist doesn't believe that. Oh, I, I have to take the TV. It was a gift. Right? They don't understand. And, and it's funny because they choose to believe Calvin, but they don't think you can choose to believe Christ. It's kind of odd, right? Choice is the main factor in salvation. Because you think about, well, what about the people that worship devils in the Old Testament? What about those that chose to worship Moloch? Oh, well, God made them do that. But, but when they worship Moloch, they threw their children in the fire. Yeah, God made them do that. Look, that's not right. That's not wicked. God said, you did things that didn't even come into my mind when you did that. And a Calvinist would say, no, God made him do it. No, God said, I didn't even think of that. Why would you do such a wicked thing, such a perverse thing? What about those that worship Shekinah? I mean, God made them do it. Oh, well, God made me worship Buddha. No, he didn't. That's your choice. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you trust him for the salvation of your soul, that is your choice. I can't make it for you. Mommy can't make it for you. Daddy can't make it for you. Your wife, your husband. You have to choose yourself. If you stand before God in unbelief, I don't care if you're in church. You could stand before God. Well, hey, why didn't you believe? You had your chance. Well, I mean, my husband, he was faithful. 
I taught my kids about you. Yeah, but you didn't believe. That's your choice. That's your problem. That's your fault. Go to hell. This is a very serious thing today. Look, let's, let's read these verses. This is the Calvinist Manifesto. These next few verses are what they base a lot of their doctrine on. And I want to help you understand them so you can teach others. Look at verse number 29 here. Romans 8, verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn of many among the brethren. So you got foreknowledge and predestination in this verse. Look at the next verse. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So you, here you have the calling, right? Those that are called. They, 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 that's the election. That means you're elected, right? Justification. That means forgiven of your sin. Glorification. That's one day we'll have that glorified body. So the first verse, we had foreknowledge, predestination. Here we have calling, justification, and glorification. This is the Calvinist Manifesto. Their goal is to redefine these terms based on the writings of John Calvin, which, by the way, John Calvin was a plagiarist. He stole from, from a Catholic from a pervert, nonetheless. Look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, election is another phrase that the Calvinists have a difficult time with. They, they can't understand that word properly. It's funny, the dispensationalists over here, they think, oh, that means always a Jew. The Calvinists over here, that means the person that God chose to go to heaven without their choice. But have you ever heard the phrase president-elect? President-elect, what does that mean? Well, this is the guy that we picked, we voted, if you believe the voting machines are legit, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Look, hey, if voting actually changed anything, they would have made it illegal years ago. Amen. All right? <laughs> But look, let's pretend that the voting machines are legit, and let's pretend that your vote counts, and let's pretend you have a decent candidate you can vote for, and you go say, I'm going to pick this guy, and he'll rule the country, he's righteous, and you go vote for this guy, he gets elected, and it's like, okay, now that we've decided, in a few months, he will become the president. That is, the president-elect. We decided, we chose him, we picked him, he is selected. So, elect means chosen or selected. Now look, we are God's chosen people, but it's because we chose to heed the call. We chose to answer Him when He called us. So foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is the first in these couple verses, and they believe it means uh, before decided, essentially. God made up His mind, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, just out of a show of hands, who of you in here knew that Brother Luke would be playing the piano today? How many of you already knew that? Wow. Did that mean it was your choice? Did that mean there was no other option that it had to be that? Good. That's foreknowledge. I knew Brother Luke would be in here playing the piano today, right? The next is predestination. How many of you knew that Luke would be at church today? Praise the Lord. He's very faithful, right? Hey, we knew he would be here playing the piano. Does that mean that Brother Luke had zero choice? He's a robot. God forced him to come here today and to play the piano. Is that what that means? No. No, I knew he would be faithful, he would be here, he would play that piano. It was his destination today, was church. I had knowledge, he'd be playing that piano. Right? The Bible says calling. The next one here is talking about the calling. We were called. Did you know, did you guys know I asked Brother Luke to be our piano player? I called him, hey, Brother Luke, will you be our piano player? Now, how did Luke respond? He answered the call. He became the elect. He is the chosen piano player. Brother Luke, I want you to play that piano. Yes, sir, I'll play it. <laughs> Done! He's elect. He's called. Yeah. He has answered that call. And look, the next one is justification. Didn't he do a good job? Wasn't I, weren't we justified in making that decision? Hey, he did it well, right? Glorification. Didn't he live up to his reputation? Those fingers... All right, I'll stop. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Luke, for allowing me to use you as an example. I didn't get his permission, but we knew he would be here. We knew he'd be playing... I asked him to do it, and if you take this same basic understanding of these words and you apply it to salvation, it makes sense. But a Calvinist does not do that. Oh, justification, this is a big word. I should go see Sir John Calvin and see what he says it means. 
Maybe he can tell me something that I don't see in the plain text of the Bible. Look, footnotes are a problem. Reading these so-called church fathers, most of which are unsaved, can cause you to stumble at very simple concepts. The Bible's clear, salvation is a gift. In John 12, he said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus said, I will draw all men. I want all men to be saved. I have called. Salvation is for all. Amen. The Calvinists don't believe that. They don't believe Jesus died for everybody. They don't believe anybody can choose to be saved. Oh, no, no, no. God picked his special people. God's not willing that any should perish. He loves the entire world. He died for the sins of the entire world. And now it's up to you what you do when you hear that call. I've given the example before. They put up, and especially in this season, right? We're voting. Man, there's po political signs. There's billboards. There's radio ads. I'm sure there's TV ads. There's YouTube ads. Vote for Amendment 1. If you vote for the P, if you vote for the kids, if you vote for taxes, like, man, I'm getting tired of hearing it. What are they doing? They're putting out the call. Come vote for us. Come vote for this amendment. Come vote for this law. Now, it's my choice whether or not I want to answer that call. I did not answer that call this year. I did not go vote. I rejected the call. Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. If you have a pen you want to write in your Bible, if you do that, highlight those terms because those are terms that are often misused by the Calvinist. And those are the points that we're going to help you understand today. And we're going to debunk the Calvinist understanding. Because how does a Calvinist perceive those words? Foreknowledge. Well, that means chose. God chose you, right? Predestination. They say that means to salvation. God picked you to be saved. Calling. Well, that's elected. Justification. That means perfection, right? Because to a Calvinist, the evidence that you are a Calvinist is that they see your good works. Glorification, that's forever. So a Calvinist would see those phrases and say, yeah, God chose me to salvation and I am elected to perfection forever. I must endure to the end and it's not even my choice to do good. God forced salvation on me. God will force his Holy Spirit in me and make me do good. Look, that's a lie. That is what Calvinists believe in a nutshell. And look, I'm being very careful. I do not want to uh, be sloppy in my teaching against Calvinism. I'm not trying to prop up some straw man. Everything that I'm saying here, I am quoting John MacArthur, John Piper, all the Calvinist greats. There's a bunch of false prophets out. Well, no, of course I'm going to endure to the end. It's not up to me, brother. The Holy Spirit does it for me. Look, all they're trying to do is brag of their works. Yep, God chose me. I'm the special one. Look, that's pride. That's arrogancy. To be saved, you have to humble yourself and admit you had something wrong and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, I've said this phrase before, and I want you to remember it, and this goes for any doctrine, but context kills Calvinism every time. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, a Calvinist showed me this verse, and I didn't know how, how to answer it. Well, here's what you do. You look for the verse that deals with faith. You look for the verse that says these people were already saved by their choices. Well, I got this verse. It proves Calvinism. Take a breath. Say a prayer. Read the whole chapter, and you will find it. In every case. There's so many verses I could go through and prove this to you today. I'm going to primarily keep it limited to Romans today. Because I want you to understand how to answer these. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Look, we are always responsible for your own choice. And that is how the context will kill the Calvinist view. The word elect, we're going to deal with that real quick. Uh, it means selection, obviously. The first mention is of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 42, saying that He is the elect of the Father. His Son is His elect. That's the first one that's selected. And guess what? We follow in the image of Him. Yeah. Guess what? We're just like Him. We are the chosen people because we have chosen Christ. When you see the word elect in the Bible, I want you to think of Christian. Christian. Look, so there was a chosen nation. They were given the oracles of God, the Word of God. So a lot of them rejected it and fell away from, by unbelief. Their bloodline didn't save them. They were not the chosen people. Oh, but I was in that tribe. Doesn't matter. Your heart wasn't right with God. God didn't select you to go to heaven because you didn't select him for salvation. The burden always comes back to the individual. 
The next mentions of it you'll typically find, especially in the New Testament, Matthew 24, where we see that the, for the elect's sake, those days would be shortened, right, during the tribulation. It says if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. There will be antichrists and false prophets that the rest of the world will wonder after. Well, I don't know. They seem real. And you're going to be saying, I don't know. There's something in me called the Holy Spirit that's telling me I don't believe that. There's something wrong with what I'm hearing. He will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That is the Christians. So elect in the New Testament is Christian. In Titus chapter 1, it says, according to the faith of God's elect. Well, who are the elect? Those that have faith. And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but in due times hath manifested his word through preaching. Well, how did they become elect? They believed. Well, what did they believe? What they heard preached. And this is where Calvinists have it all mixed up. Well, we don't have to go preaching. God will draw those he wants. God will draw those that he has picked to come to our Presbyterian church and become a Calvinist. We don't believe that. If people don't show up at their church, that doesn't mean they're not saved. We are called to go out and preach the gospel. The person that hears the gospel is responsible to answer that. Yes, I believe that. And then they're saved. Whether or not they ever come to the church, whether or not they even understand who John Calvin is, whether or not they ever open their Bible, salvation is by hearing the word and choosing to believe it. Amen. Trusting the gospel. That's how it's always been. And in due times, he hath manifested his word through preaching. That's why we send you out every week preaching. That's why we preach. Eternal life is to those that have faith. They're called elect. They're saved through preaching. Look, you're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's start at the beginning of the chapter. This, actually, let's start at verse number 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, the word sanctified means set apart. The Bible teaches you are sanctified in the Spirit once you're saved. And now on your daily walk, you need to choose to set yourself apart from the world. You need to die to those desires, to those lusts. So there is a sanctification of the flesh and of the Spirit. Let's not ignore that. Uh, look at verse number 5 here. Because, well, before we move on, verse 2, at the beginning he says, Elect according to the foreknowledge. See, clearly God chose me to go to heaven and you other people. Right? That's the Calvinist attitude. It's wicked. Look at verse 5. Let's look at the context. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, how is it I'm elect according to the foreknowledge of God? He knows the beginning from the end. He is outside of time. He created time during creation on day number one. He was before time. He will be after time. He sees every decision I'll ever make. That doesn't mean he forces my decision. It says in verse 5, I am saved by faith. Through faith unto salvation. That makes me elect. God foreseeing this, having knowledge of what my decision would be, he then made decisions of how he could use me. Right? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Well, what do you mean context kills Calvinism? Right? What do you mean by that? Hey, any key verse that a Calvinist will use, just look for faith. Find the other verse. Well, doesn't the Bible say God called us with a holy calling? Huh? Doesn't that prove Calvinism? Well, yes, the Bible does say that, but we answered the call, and that's how we got saved. And that's in 2 Timothy. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Timothy was saved by faith. How did he have faith? Well, it's what his mama preached and his grandmama preached. It's what he would, hey, that's what, hey, mama said, this is true. This is God. This is salvation. He said, I believe that. He got saved. But yet they use the verse, just a few verses later it says, who hath saved us and called us with unholy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He called you, hey, I got a free gift. Hey, who wants this free gift? Timothy said, I'll take that. The Calvinist ignores the, the verse about salvation by faith and then goes straight to, well, it says God called us. He picked me. He didn't pick you. That's not what it teaches. That's not what it says. The context kills that verse. 
Same things in 1 Corinthians. Well, doesn't it say many are called? Or I'm sorry, not many are called? In other words, God didn't die for everybody? Yes, it does. But again, the context would kill the Calvinist spin, and you're still saved by faith. In 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. How were you saved? Somebody preached to you, and you believed it. You got saved. Right. The Calvinist in this ver in a few verses down, it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. See, not many are called. Just us Calvinists, that's not what it says. It says those that answered the call, those that believe the call, there's very few. And guess what? It's not the smartest people in the world. Well, are you saying Christians are dumb? No, I'm saying it doesn't matter about your physical wisdom. What matters is you have some spiritual wisdom, and you understand God created me. I feel it. I'm born with light in my heart, and I understand that I have a creator. I have to deal with him afterwards. I want to deal now. I want to answer to him now. He's called us all, but not all have answered. So dealing with this, the calling, the predestination, the foreknowledge, you're in Ephesians chapter 1. This is one of their go-to passages, and we will see how the context will kill it. Look at verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Now look, this book was written to Christians. Ephesians was written to Christians, those already saved. Well, he chose us to be Christians. That's not what it's saying. He's chosen you now that you are saved to walk in newness of life, to submit yourself to his commandments, to obey his word, or else he will correct you on the earth. But they want to, oh, see, he's chosen us before the foundation. I was chosen. God picked me to go to heaven. No, God picked you to hear the gospel, and you chose. And a lot of the Calvinists literally reject that gospel. A lot of the Calvinists would say, oh, you think you can save yourself by believing the gospel? That's works. What a strange spin that they would put on the simplicity of the gospel. Wait, you're saying because I'm saying I can't work my way to heaven, that I believe that I, I'm working? It's confusing. Calvinism is ultimately confusing, but yet it's sort of like a real heady uh, system of theology that everybody wants to study. And when these Calvinists get together and debate each other, well, Dr. So-and-so said this. Oh, well, Dr. So-and-so said that. Hey, how about the Lord Jesus Christ? How about the Apostle Paul? How about Peter? They killed Calvinism. Calvinism is a false doctrine from the devil. Look at verse 5 here. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Well, see there it says predestined. I was predestined to be saved. Well, that's not what it says. The destination is adoption. In other words, you became a child of God. We will be conformed to the image of His Son. We're chosen that we should be holy now that we're saved. And we are predestined that we will be sons of God. We'll meet the Lord in the resurrection. Look at verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained inheritance. Now there's a twofold to our inheritance. We have the Holy Spirit in us now to help us, to lead us and guide us into truth. It doesn't make decisions for us. In fact, when you make a decision against it, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if you had a paid advisor? A lawyer. I'm paying this lawyer $300 an hour to go with me everywhere. And I'm going to go do something. The lawyer says, I wouldn't do that. You're going to get in trouble. Nah. I wouldn't do that. Come on, man. Leave me alone. I'm paying you. You be quiet. Right, can you imagine? I don't care if I get caught. I don't care if I go to jail. Like, I wouldn't do that. You're going to get in trouble. That's like the Holy Spirit. Hey, I'm going to lead you and guide you into all truth. I will reveal things to you. I'll show you things to come. That's the spirit of truth. It's there to comfort you and to guide you, and you grieve it. Man, leave me alone. I ain't got time for that. I want to do what I want to do. Now, a Christian can make that decision, and they will be corrected of God. They grieve the Holy Spirit. So here when he says, in whom we have obtained, verse 11, an inheritance. We have the Holy Spirit. We also have an inheritance to come, right? Heaven and the resurrection, the new heaven and new earth, for eternity with Christ. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, God's will is that I would be, that I am, no, God's will is that you should believe on him. God's will is that you should be saved, but it's still your choice. It's not without your own will. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Well, uh-oh, that ruins it all. 
They, had, uh, they said predestined right there. I mean, it says he's chosen us. It was the will of God. And what, did, what was God's will? That you obeyed. And what's the evidence of that? That you trusted. How did they get saved? They trusted. Therefore, this letter is for them. Now that you've trusted Christ and you're a Christian, I'm here to tell you that God wants you to stop sinning. I'm here to preach the Word of God, and the Bible says to make sin exceeding sinful. Well, I want to keep, you know, getting drunk. Well, you can. It won't cause you to lose your salvation, but God will correct you. He'll take the blessing away from you. Well, I want to continue in lust and in fornication. Well, you can. You won't lose your salvation, but God will judge you. If you sleep around, God might make sure you get an STD. Just to, hey, now that I've got you humbled, and now that I've got you slowed down, listen to me. I'm trying to protect you. Just like a father trying to tell a child, you know, don't jump off the roof. You know? Think about it. He's there to protect you. Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're saved by your own choice to believe the gospel. The Calvinists love Ephesians 1 because they've got those key words here, but they stop right there. They don't keep reading. They want to take it out of context and push their doctrine, but yet the Bible says you have to trust those that trusted after they heard the gospel of your salvation, after you believed that gospel. You heard the gospel, you trusted for salvation, you've been ch you chose to answer that. Now you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you make the right decision. Now you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you so you recognize the word of God. So when you read it, you say, yeah, that's what God wants me to do. Look, you still have a choice. He's not going to twist your arm and force it. Salvation wasn't forced on you, neither is your daily walk. The daily walk ought to be to obey the commandments. If it is not, you're still saved. That's the good news. The bad news is, He will correct you on this earth. He will correct you on this earth. He loves you. If only Calvinists would read these two verses, trusted, trusted, heard the gospel of your salvation, and believed. They believe that salvation is just forced on somebody. And that once they're saved because God picked them, then they will live a perfect life, and that also is forced on them by the Holy Spirit. It's very strange doctrine. Look at verse number 15 here. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. Look, how many times does he have to say it? This chapter does not preach that you can't choose to be saved. In fact, it teaches quite the opposite. I mean, for every, ver every word predestined or chosen, you have at least two words, trusted, believed, right? You have called on the Lord. Your faith is what saves you. So the context of verses 4 and 5 here is that you have to choose to believe. And then you have to choose to use the power of the Holy Spirit living in you to walk in the Spirit. This is a daily choice. Salvation is a one-time choice. Reprobation is the same way, right? But salvation is a one-time choice. After that, you have to choose every day. You have to die daily. Pray without ceasing. Choose to walk in the Spirit. Now that you are saved, you should choose to try to stop sinning to please God. Now that you're a son of God, you will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before Him and answer for the things you did in the flesh. Look, you will not be punished at the judgment seat of Christ. You may suffer loss. What does that mean? Well, I had an opportunity to preach the gospel. Instead, I was lazy and I went and watched TV. Well, I'm going to answer for that. God won't punish me for watching TV in heaven. But he'll say, look, I had a reward. You lost that one. You lost that opportunity. Now, when you serve me and rule and reign with me, you're going to be down here, whereas you could have been up here. We will all probably suffer loss in a different way at the reward. But hey, it's, it's something we need to look forward to and plan on and get excited about. That is our destination. When this body passes away, guess what? My destination is to stand before Christ. My destination is to rule and reign with Christ. Amen. That's where I'm going. Yep. That's what I'm predestined to, and it's because I've chosen to believe. Look at verse number 18 here. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his, the inheritance of saints. Right? We will rise again. That's that inheritance. We've been called to serve. 
There's the calling for salvation. There's also a calling to disciple. There's a calling to ministry. There's a calling to preach. There's a calling to, once you're saved, God can now use you. And guess what? He won't force it on you. Well, I, I, I didn't want to be a pastor, but God forced it on me. You know, he just, no, that's not true. Not true at all. Well, I didn't want to go to men's preach tonight, but God just forced me to do it. It's not the God of the Bible, my friend. Look, he's given you an opportunity that you can be rewarded for. It's up to you to earn the reward. Right. He's not going to force it on you. Look at verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? You hear that? Who believe? Again, a multitude of times in this chapter, God makes it clear. It's up to you. You're responsible. You have to choose. And if not, well, your destination is down there. If you do choose to believe, guess what? Your destination changes. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So again, every key verse or passage that a Calvinist likes to use, they ignore the context that the people are either already saved and God's calling them to make the choice to live right, or they're ignoring the fact that it's clearly talking about how they need to choose to believe, that it's up to them, trusting in the gospel that they hear, that it only comes by hearing the gospel preached. You know, John 1.12 is one that's often misrepresented, where to them gave you power, he says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Now, if they ever quote you that verse and they stop right there, the Calvinists will like to use it, and, the, and those that preach are repenting your sins to be saved, See, right there, he gave you the power to work your way to heaven, is what they're essentially, but that's not what it says, is it? It's not saying God gave you the power, now all you have to do is do all the works. God opened the door, you better work to keep that thing open. It's not what it's saying. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Once you believe you are a son of God, he will never kick you out of the family. You're always a child, your destination is set. Now, your lifestyle and your, your rewards and your blessing on the earth, that's up to you. That's whatever you put in. You get paid for what you do. Right. Salvation is to all that believe. Once they've heard, the Holy Spirit is there in their life to give them power. And again, the Holy Spirit will not force you to preserve to the end. Sin is a choice just as much as salvation is a choice. Calvinists don't understand that. John 3, he that believeth on him is not condemned. If you believe on Christ, you don't answer for your sins because he already paid for them. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Wait, so you're saying those people that reject the gospel? Yeah, you know what it, they've chosen. Listen, I think Calvinists, see, because Calvinism teaches the reprobate doctrine or the sons of the devil. They will teach, well, God picked people to go to hell, but that's not true. They, well, there are sons of the devil, and there's nothing they can do to be saved. Now, that's partially true. They had their opportunity. They reject it. Sin lieth at the door, Cain. What are you going to do? Forget God. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm following the wicked one. Now, at that point, it was too late for Cain. Cain had his opportunity. Cain heard the gospel. Cain knew all he had to do was believe. He didn't want to obey. He didn't want to obey the gospel. He didn't want to obey God. So what did he do? Well, I'm, I'm going with sin. I'm going to go do whatever I want. Okay, Cain. It's going to cost you. Not just on earth, but eternity. And Calvinists don't get that. They say, well, those people are obvious. I mean, they worship the devil. They're clearly reprobate. Okay, sure. How'd they get that way? Well, God picked them. No, they picked it. That's their choice. That's their lifestyle. They're reaping what they've sown. I mean, just reaping and sowing. Come on, Calvinists. <laughs> Figure it out, right? John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How do you avoid hell? You hear the word and you believe and you're saved. You have to make the choice. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. It doesn't start then, it starts now. You know, John MacArthur, he is a, a wicked devil in particular. Yeah. He's very subtle. He's very sly. He's very shifty on his doctrines. And he actually teaches that when it says you must be born again, that that means born from above. So how do you, how do you get born again, John MacArthur? God from above picked you to get saved. But that's not what Jesus said in this chapter, in John chapter 3. Jesus said you need to choose. 
Jesus gave an option. You need to believe. It's up to you to believe. You want everlasting life? It's up to you. And once you believe, you're saved. You have eternal life from that moment. John MacArthur teaches you don't get everlasting life until you've endured to the end. Until you remain sinless for the rest of your life, then maybe in the millennium you might have everlasting life. That's not what the Bible teaches. You have it at the moment you believe. You're sealed by that spirit of promise. We read that. Yes. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. You're preserved. You're protected. You're in God's hand. No man can pluck you out of, out of his hand. God gave you the choice and you chose. Look, you're in. And, and, you know, Calvinists don't understand biblical salvation or biblical reprobation. The waters have been muddied. The choice has been eliminated. It's a choiceless salvation which saves nothing. You're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse number 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you understand what that says? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 12. Those that reject God are damned. God says you're damned. It was your choice. He didn't say, I picked you to be damned. Those are damned who believed not the truth. They're cursed by their choices to ignore the gospel. Look at the next verse. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Well, now is that a Calvin? He chose us to salvation. Now he's choosing us because we chose him. We made him, the, we, hey, I believe. He said, good, you're saved. You're a son now. Belief of the truth. How are we chosen? By belief of the truth. Because we believe what was preached. Look at verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Called you by our gospel. How were we chosen? We were called how were we called? By the gospel. The only way to get saved is to hear the gospel preached. If you, you can't believe the truth without hearing it, once you hear it and believe it, you're saved. You're chosen. You're called. You're elect. Go to Romans chapter 1. Look, he called every person. Not everyone answered. Calvinists choose to believe John Calvin's decisionless salvation. They just delegate, oh, well, maybe I am a Calvinist. Maybe I am a Christian. We'll find out if I endure to the end, won't we? They have no confidence in their salvation because they don't believe they can believe. Well, maybe I am picked. We'll find out, won't we? That's not a good attitude. That's not everlasting life. That is not assurance. That's not making it sure. Make your election, you're calling an election sure. Hey, it's a sure thing. It's a firm thing. It's a solid thing because I have called. I called on the Lord. That was his promise. He made a promise. I took it. I called some friends for dinner. Hey, call, hey, we're going to dinner. My treat. Come on, we're going to dinner. We're going to dinner. Guess what? Not everybody answered that call. Some got the voicemail and said, I don't believe he's going to buy dinner for everybody. That was their choice. It was up to them. God has called everybody. He's furnished his table. Salvation is free. They're too busy. He says, go into the highways and the hedges. Preach the gospel to everyone. Let everyone know of the free gift of salvation. Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. Those verses, those phrases are what they use. That is the Calvinist manifesto. God picked us. Look, what, does those, what do those phrases really mean? God knows your choice. He has knowledge of what your choice will be. Therefore, it, your, your choice sets your destination, which is heaven which is salvation. He called you, you were called, He called you by the gospel. And here's the thing, if I call both of you to go to dinner and only one goes, you were both called, but it only applies to you because you ignored it. Right? We are called, but so were you. So was the whole world. We are called, we believe. He called you by the gospel preaching to be justified or to be forgiven of all your sin. Hey, and one day, we will be conformed to the image of His Son. One day, we will have a glorified body, a supernatural body. 1 Corinthians 15 says, it is, we will be resurrected, right? And it talks about the celestial and the terrestrial, the terrain and the stars. One day, we're going to have an angelic body. We'll have Christ's image on us. 
We won't be gods, but we will, we will look like him. We will be like him. We will rule with him. You're in Romans chapter 1. We're almost done here. Look at verse number 7. Verse number 7. Now, we're memorizing this as a church. I hope, I hope everybody uh, understands the context here. I think this is actually uh, good timing for this. Many of you have already committed this verse to your heart, but let's look at it in context, what's going on here. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Well, there you go. There's Calvinism. Romans 1, verse 7. Should we keep reading? Should we look at the context and see what's actually being taught here? Called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Their faith saved them and made them saints. He wrote it to them. I've heard you guys are saints. I've heard about your faith. Therefore, you've been called to be saints. We were all called, but not everybody answered it. Jump ahead, look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, now, how did they become saints? It said they were called to be saints. What was that calling? It's called the preaching of the gospel. Why are we memorizing this passage as a church? To remember why we preach the gospel. It's very important. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God is not a racist. God does not play favorites. God is not a respecter of persons. Yeah. He has called all. We preach to all. We're a debtor to everyone. We tell everyone. And the gospel is the power to salvation. Amen. Not Calvinism. Not God's selection. And it's to everyone that believes. To everyone that believeth. Verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live from fa by faith. Hey, my faith to your faith. Hey, let me share my faith with you. That's a legit phrase, right? I, am sh I have faith, and my faith, I'm going to tell you what I believe about the gospel, and if you believe it as well, it's from faith to faith. How do people get saved? From person to person. You can't just pick up a piece of paper and say, oh, it all makes sense now. No, you need the Holy Spirit in a man of God, in a lady of God, preaching the Word of God, the Gospel, so they can choose to hear, choose to believe, and choose to trust on Christ. Amen. Salvation is a choice. Calvinists don't understand choice. That's the problem. And it's almost like they think they don't make choices during the day. Well, am I going to run this red light or not? Well, God has already predetermined it. <laughs> hey, are you going to stop for that stop sign? Well, you know, brother, God is sovereign. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? That's you blaming your stupid choices on God. Right. And it's bad enough that a bunch of Christians, well, you know, I didn't really want to do all that, but the devil made me do it. Yeah. Well, now how come you fell out of church, you quit preaching, how come you went back to those old wicked ways, and you're doing things that you know you ought not, that God said he'll judge, why did you do it? Oh, brother, boy, but God made me do it. Could you imagine someone saying that? Yeah, God made me do it. God didn't make you do anything. God's given you the gift of salvation and you chose to be saved and now that you're saved, God has given you the gift of free will to choose to obey. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? You don't have to obey. He will correct you. Daddy's going to spank you and he's going to keep getting you and he's going to keep getting you until, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. Unless you want to sin unto death. Let him take you home early. Yeah. Right? The body will be destroyed, but the soul is saved. And that's our choice, our daily choice as a Christian. Look at verse 21 in this chapter, right? Because Calvinists don't understand the choice of reprobation either. They truly believe that God chose the wicked to be wicked. Well, what about that person that murdered a bunch of people? Well, God made him that way. No, he didn't. Well, what about that person that was a cannibal and a molester? Yeah, God chose those things to happen. No. God gave him an opportunity. And they, by their own will, rejected God. And God said, go act like a filthy animal. And they abused the power they had and they hurt other people. To, to blame God for other people's sin is a very wicked thing. Yeah. It's very wicked. Look, you can't even blame the devil. Blame yourself. Take some blame upon yourself and thank God that he's forgiving. Look at verse 21 here. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
They chose to reject God. Look at verse 24. We're going to breeze through this for the sake of time. Wherefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. What happened? Their own lust. They chose lust rather than God. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. How do cannibals and child molesters get that way? They didn't like God. They gave up on God. God gave them over to a rejected mind, a reprobate mind, to do the things that are not natural. The things that a regular human being would look at that and say, how in the world can you even do that? Go to Romans chapter 4. Flip ahead to Romans chapter 4. They made their choice and they got what they wanted. God rejected them. They became sons of the devil by their own choice. Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Listen. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. The Calvinist would teach, how do I know that you're really a Christian? Well, let me see your good works to the end of your life. That Holy Spirit's going to force it on you. You will endure sinless to the end. That's not true. That is not true. We must die daily. We must choose to walk in the new man. We must put away the lust. Look at verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. God will forgive the sinners, the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. You don't have to stop sinning to be saved. Proof that you're saved is not that you stop sinning either. Look, God's given you the power to overcome these things, but don't ever point at somebody's lifestyle and determine their salvation. That's an error. It's not by works. Abraham was still a sinner, but yet he believed God. He was still ungodly after that fact, and God said, that's okay, you're righteous in the soul. You are right. Go to Romans chapter 8. We are justified of all sins because of the gift of righteousness that God gave us. Romans 5, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are forgiven by sins because we have faith, because we've trusted. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're not there today, but Ephesians 2, the Calvinists love to point there and say, well, God gave us the, the faith. The faith is the gift. No, no, no. It says, the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is salvation. We don't deserve that. All we have to do is choose, though. Look, you're in Romans chapter 8. Let's take this in context now. Look at verse number 16. Written to save people. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also may be also glorified together. Again, one day we will be glorified. Christ suffered, he died, he rose again, he has a new body. We will have a new body one day in the resurrection. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that God picked. Is that what your Bible says? Now, wait a minute. What's it say here? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that are the called according to His purpose. You chose God. You chose to love Him. He says, don't worry. You're going to go through rough times. It'll work out. I'll work it out in the end. You'll see it'll be better than it was. God loves us. He wants us to grow. So moving forward. So in verse 29, this is your Calvinist manifesto. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He foresaw your choice to trust in him. And your destination is set, it is heaven. In the meantime, we ought to be conformed to the image of his Son by choosing to try to live better. 
And we will be conformed to the image of his son by one day having a resurrected body. But you notice here he says the firstborn among many brethren. The Bible says Jesus was the first begotten from the dead. When was Christ begotten? When he rose again. That's when the, that's what, hey, that's what we're looking for. I'm not just looking for how he was born in the flesh. Hey, we've all been born in the flesh. I'm looking how he was born again in the spirit and born again and resurrected from the dead. That's how we're conformed to his image. Look at verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Again, what's the calling? The preaching of the gospel. Did you answer that? We're justified by his blood. And one day we'll be with him in glory. One day we'll be glorified. That doesn't mean it's automatic. Now look again at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Again, election is difficult for them to understand. It just means chosen. God chose you because you answered the call. God said, yeah, I can use that faith. I can use that humble heart. Thank you. Now I'll put you to work. Now I got something else for you to do. I'm going to call you to a ministry. So again, the Calvinist manifesto is destroyed by context. It's our responsibility to choose to trust. And, and Calvinism likes to throw that out. Well, you don't, have, don't decide now. Just try to endure sinless, and that might prove that you're one of us. Strange doctrine indeed. Look, thank God he saves. Thank God he died for all. Look, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. This does not say God chose you to salvation, and now you'll endure sinless forever. That is not what these doctrines teach. Go to Romans 10, and we'll be done. I want you to see this in Romans 10. God knows your choice, and your choice determines your destination. He called you by the gospel. That's the calling, the gospel preaching. And once you hear the gospel, hey, you can be justified. You can be forgiven of all your sins, and one day resurrect and be glorified. Is that not the gospel we preach? Is that not the purpose of the Christian church today? Look, from Romans 1 in the beginning, faith, believe, trust. Romans 4, Romans 5, the gift of righteousness. Romans 6, I mean, all the way through Romans, you're building up to this chapter. But a Calvinist would like to take Roman, parts of Romans 8 and parts of Romans 9 out and isolate it. Parts of Ephesians 1, parts of Ephesians 2, and isolate it. But I promise you, if you're ever backed in a corner on any doctrine by any false prophet, you will prevail if you understand that the context will destroy the bad doctrine. And if you pray to the Lord, Lord, I need to give an answer, and I don't have one. I don't have any knowledge here. Let me read this in context. And Lord, you reveal me the answer and help me to give them an answer. God will give you the power to debunk their foolishness, their false doctrine. Look at Romans 10 here, and we'll be done. We'll start in verse number 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. You're saved. It's from faith to faith. The word, the gospel, is in your heart, and that's what we're giving it to their heart. And what is it? It's the word of faith. You have to believe. You have to have faith. Look at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believes, and they're saved. In the heart, if you trust on the Lord, your soul is spotless, it's sinless. He paid for it all. Amen. Even the stuff you haven't done yet, He has made a promise. He will keep His promise. Now look, your day-to-day -day life, you need to talk to your dad. You need to repent of your sins on a day-to-day -day life. Now that you're saved by faith, you need to confess your sins and forsake your sins, and He will bless you. That's God's purpose. It's Christian walk. Look at verse 11 here. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Your call is the answer to the Gospel. Hey, you can be saved if you want. Do you want it? Yes, I want it. Save me, Lord. You're saved. That was his promise. That is the gospel. 
all that call upon. Notice the Jews, God's not, God doesn't pick people. It's up to you. And the Calvinists would love to just say, well, a little bit of Romans 8 and a little bit of Romans 9, and that's our manifesto. Hey, how about number 10? How about chapter 1? How about chapter 4, 5, 6, 7? How about all the other chapters surrounding it? Because they debunk Calvinism. How about the book of John? You sure don't see them teaching any Calvinism out of the book of John, do you? Oh, it says here they, could, they couldn't believe. Oh, it says here you have to believe. You have to choose to believe. Yeah. Where's the Calvinism in the book of John? Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's our purpose right here. These next two verses, three verses, is your mission in life now that you're saved. How then shall they call in him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Listen, every one of you are called to be a preacher. If, somebody, if your best friend goes to hell because they didn't hear the gospel, it's because you were not a preacher. It's your responsibility. Look at verse 15. And how shall they be preached except they be sent? That's what I'm doing right now. I'm sending you. I'm compelling you. I'm commanding you. Christ has given us all power to go preach the gospel. Now use it. Use it. Make it a priority. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For he saith, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? They have not all obeyed. And you all know this. You knock on it. Well, I don't, I don't want to hear it. You didn't obey. Well, I understand what you're saying. I had one last week. I mean, I, I logically understand what you're I mean, if I don't believe, then I'll go to, I get all that. I, I know what you're saying. He didn't believe. He didn't want to believe. That was his choice. I didn't force it on him. God didn't force it on him. You can't blame the atmosphere, his lifestyle, any of it. It was his choice. Look at the last verse here. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Salvation is an individual choice. It is free. It is eternal. It lasts forever. It is for all. It is for everyone. And it will not be forced upon you. If you go to hell, it's your choice. If you go to heaven, that was your choice as well. And that is what the Calvinist Manifesto ignores. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for making the gospel simple. Lord, thank you for dying for everyone and not just picking individuals. Lord, we don't deserve salvation. We're not special. But Lord, we've heard your calling. We've answered your calling. And Lord, we're going to go out preaching the gospel today. I pray that you would bless our time and our effort. Lord, I pray you would tenderize the hearts and help us to help others call on you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the free gift of salvation. I pray you'd bless the rest of our time together today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.